All right, everybody, I'm Aaron Caden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Newport Moorhead City. Uh, good evening to everybody that's joining us virtually, but also here at the EOC. Really appreciate everybody joining us. A couple of housekeeping items, especially for the virtual folks. You'll have a chance to ask questions and chat with us, especially at the end. So if you have a question at any point of the presentation, please ask it. Uh, we will get to it at the end. We can also unmute your mics uh, if you raise your hand. So um, by the end, if you have any questions, please ask us. Uh, special thanks to Drew and James uh, at Dare County for setting this all up. I'll get to the specifics about the technology part in terms of the webinar, because there are a couple things to go through, especially if you're at home in terms of uh, how you should be viewing this. So if you want to speak at the end, if you want to ask a question, all you need to do is click on the orange rectangle with the white arrow, and that will open up the whole panel. And that's where in the chat or question box, you can ask uh, a question. And again, we won't get those uh, until the end. All of your microphones are muted right now. So if you're watching from home, don't worry about background noise, anything like that. Just kind of sit back and relax. At the end, when we do the Q&A, that's when we will unmute you if you raise your hand. We have a lot of good information in the handout section. Drew's presentation, which is coming up, that is attached as a PDF. A lot of links to some really, really good videos that he's going to show. If you have any trouble viewing those now, those are in the PDF. My presentation also as a PDF, so please download that. That will be in the handout section of this presentation. All of this will be emailed to you by tomorrow. It's a long drive from Moorhead City, so it won't be tonight. It will be by tomorrow. We have all your email addresses. So Drew's PDF, my PDF will all be sent to you um, by tomorrow afternoon. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Drew. We're gonna hop out and jump into his presentation. He's gonna go over some Dare County specific information. And then the second half of the talk is gonna be me talking about all the impacts of a storm. So Drew, you are ready and I'll hand you that. Oops. I'll hand you the keys to the car. It's just the right arrow. Well, I'm, I'm going to start off with welcome everybody that's here with us at the EOC. It's great to have you with us. And I'm going to talk to the camera for a second. And I, I don't know if you're seeing or hearing me. I'm putting faith into the weather service that you can. So I'm really excited that we're able to use the technology that the weather service has brought to us. I know it works, but uh, I'm hoping you can hear and see me uh, here at the EOC, your EOC here in Dare County. It's great to have you with us. My presentation has uh, got some videos in it. Uh, we love technology and we love the challenges it brings. Uh, we think we got through it, but I think we'll hear it loud and clear in the room here. Can't guarantee it for the folks on the end, but Eric did say you'll be able to see those in uh, in the PDFs and otherwise. And please, I'll, I'll uh, there's, the videos are hopefully will be self-explanatory even without the words for the most part. But with that said, uh, my theme is get ready because it's that time. We're already in hurricane season. Uh, it only takes one. Uh, we're already three down for this year, which uh, last year at this time we were seven down. So maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know, but it only takes one storm. That's the forecast, and Eric's probably going to talk a little bit more about that than I will, because he's the weather professional, and I'm just the guy who takes advantage of the weather professionals to share information. But we're already into the season. And with that said, I, I got seven simple things to ask people to do now. Okay, they're seven, they're simple. I hopefully they're simple. One is determine your risk. I know some of you live in a flood flood area. You probably know it's at the X zone or the AE zone. That's really not your risk. Everybody lives in a flood zone out here. You could get wet anywhere in this county. You could have damages from wind. You could have damages from rising water, flood water. Uh, the flood zones are for flood insurance purposes. Evacuation zones are where you need to think about how deep that water you're going to get from storm surge and other hazards. So know what your risk is, and the entire county is at risk. Um, develop an evacuation plan. I, I ask this in every presentation I go to, who has an evacuation plan? I get a couple hands coming up. I say, I've got an evacuation plan, because I do. My plan is I come here, my wife gets in the car and goes to Virginia. And that's our plan, because I know I'm gonna be here with uh, many of my best friends, and I got a plan to come here, and she's got a plan to go somewhere else. But make sure you have that evacuation plan. Know where you're going to go, know where you're going to stay, and don't rely on a shelter. Okay, I'm going to say that about 10 times in this presentation. Don't rely on a shelter. A shelter is the last place you want to go. The only thing that's good about a shelter is it's safe. That's about it. 
If you have friends that come and visit in this beautiful county from far away, go visit them during a hurricane. Get out here and go visit with your friends that are not freeloading with you, but coming down to take advantage of the beach when it's nice. And when it's not nice, go visit them. Take the, get that plan. Know where you're going to do with your pets. Do all of those things now. Think about that plan now so that when the evacuation order is issued, don't be saying, where's the shelter at? Be going, I'm getting in my car. I got my plan. I'm going here. And we're, we're getting past the COVID challenges that we've had, but we still, if you ended up in a shelter, it could be a congregate shelter or non-congregate shelter. You could be in an auditorium in a school or you may be in a hotel. Those things are places you don't want to rely on. They're safe places, but have your plan now and know what you're going to do. As you do that, now's the time to refresh those supply kits. So make sure you have everything you need so that when you get up and go, you've got food for the dogs, food for the pets, the kids, the medicine, all of the things you need, water, things like that. And if you do stay at home, have staying at home, but have it ready to go with you. So when you get in a car to go, you take it with you. There's a lot of good information on readync.org for that tough stuff to help you plan and fill those kits. It's never too late to get an insurance checkup. If you got flood insurance, good. If you don't, think about it. Even if you're in the X zone, think about flood insurance. It's cheaper. It's there. It's available to you. But get it now because it's not effective for about 30 days after you get the policy. So get it now. Do you can check up on your homeowners. Make sure that's all in place. Make sure you got your coverages. Do all the things now so that when you need it, it's not going to fail you. Um, get your home ready. Uh, help your neighbors. Uh, if you As you live out here, you start to remember to put the stuff away the things are going to fly around the yard go across the street into their neighbor's yard tidy up the yard get everything ready make sure your your gutters are able to work and all those things you need if you got shutters know where they are know how you're going to get them up if you don't have shutters think about what you're going to do if you got to protect your home do that now and if you've got neighbors help your neighbors sometimes we forget about our neighbors but our neighbors are just to, they might need more help than we than they can do themselves, offer them that help. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to help your neighbors in the, in the future. So um, strengthen your home, help your neighbors. Know your trusted sources of information. I, I rely on that guy for weather information. That's about it. And then, well, Eric or Dave mm -hmm. Glenn or Scott Kennedy, the forecasters down at the, the National Weather Service Office of the Moorhead, or the folks down at the Hurricane Center. Uh, that's who I turn to. I don't look at the SPA miles, I don't look at anything, I look at what they're giving us. But know your trusted sources of information. Hurricane Center, Forecast Office, Ready NC, which is an app that puts information out. And also, if you're out here or anywhere, you can sign up for OBX Alerts, and I'll show you a little bit about that in the future. Number seven is complete a written hurricane plan. Why is it important to write it down? Because if you don't write it down, when you're under the crunch, you're not going to know what you talked about, where you're going to go. You're not going to know what you told your family you're going to do. But if you take it out and pull it out, it's time to get the kit. Oh, forgot the water. Get the water. We're going to get the car. We're going to go to Raleigh. We're going to do this. Have it written down so when you're under pressure, you have it in front of you being can execute it. So seven things to do now. Um, we get a lot of questions about emergency decision-making out here on the Outer Banks. And Mary, you went through this many a time uh, when you were in office. But... We, we put together a video, uh, emergency decision-making out here, and I'm not sure how long it's gonna, can you click that right for me? And this is one that the people in the, out of, on the virtual world may not hear. We're telling them how we decision. So I'm just going to play and.
So that video we put together really to help people understand how decisions are made out here. For the folks that out in the uh, virtual world, if you didn't hear it, it is available on our website. You can go to our website under emergency management and find that video there. It's uh, also on YouTube, so it's there and available to you. And Eric's going to share that as uh, yeah, as well. As well in the handout section, the PDF of Drew's presentation. If you just kind of have that loaded up and follow along, when you get to that slide, if you're having audio issues, it might not be on your end. Just click on the uh, image and the uh, video will load up on your home computer or mobile device. So you have that on, um, on yourself right now. So, yeah. so uh, we're sorry about that if you didn't hear it out in the in the virtual world tonight. But with that said, I wanted to move on to evacuation zones. Last year, the state implemented uh, evacuation zones across the entire coastal community in North Carolina. We have two of them in North, in Dare County. We have Zone A, which is all of Hatteras Island, and Zone B, which is the rest of the county. We we evacuate by zones. We lay it out in verbiage. And we will also say zone A or zone B. If you go to the knowyourzonenc.gov website, they have a lookup tool. You can put your address in. And if you're not certain if you're on Hatteras Island or in Manio, you can put it in there and it'll straighten it out for you. It'll tell you what zone you're in. But it's a really neat tool. But I, I share that. We only have two zones, but a place like New Hanover, if you have family down there, has multiple zones. They might have five zones. And to make it down to the street level and in the downtown area, and it may be one zone on one side of the street and a different zone on the other side of the street. So it's an important tool for everybody who lives in a coastal community or who might be visiting a coastal community across the state. I talked about this before, I put it up again, have a plan. Um, last year when I put this slide together, life-threatening storm surge flooding and high winds take priority. And I was saying that over uh, whether or not you had to, that, COVID challenges. They still needed to go and get away from the hazard here uh, and go somewhere else to be safe. There, you went to somebody else's home, wherever it might be. But it's still just as important to have that plan and be ready to evacuate. Uh, be ready to go when the evacuation is ordered. Take that kit. As I said earlier, listen for inland shelters. I'll show you where you can hear those shelters. But don't go to a shelter. Have a plan to go somewhere else so you don't end up in either a congregate or non-congregate shelter. And shelters may not even have cots for the first 24 to 48 hours. They may have a, a cold meal for you, but it's not someplace you want to be. We do have uh, transportation available. So for those folks that may be challenged getting somewhere, either they don't drive or they're here visiting with us and they don't have a car, uh, they, all they have to do is call our EOC number. We have our activity buses and we'll get them to a shelter. But we have the way to do that. So big plans now don't include a shelter. For that evacuation, okay? I hit that hard enough. So this is the readync.org page. This is where you can get information on how to put the kits together, how you can develop your plans. A lot of great information there. Uh, it's also in a mobile version. So if everything failed, your, your friend said, "Don't come here. Go somewhere else." As you're driving halfway across the state, open up the mobile app. You can look for open shelters, and it'll give you directions to get to the open shelters. So it's there and available for you. It's also got great information on outages, road conditions, all that information right in the handheld device you may have with you. I'm not going to show this video. Uh, it's a little bit older, but it talks about how to sign up for a special medical needs registry. People can go to that site there and do that. Um, so this is if you have a neighbor who might need some help or if you want to get on the special medical needs registry, if you know somebody who has a medical condition or may need a help from one of our emergency medical services technician to help you get somewhere. People can sign up. Katie McCarran, our social services, adult services director, runs that program. And I, I tell you, uh, usually we're talking to Eric early and Katie's talking to her people who are in the social medical registry really early. She's calling them saying, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Do you need help? So if you have people on uh, oxygen, on other medical needs, She's taking care of that. We're getting ahead of that. And we're trying to get them to someplace where they can be cared for by family, or in the worst case, we get them to a state medical shelter somewhere inland. But we have a great team that allows us to take care of the people that need a little extra hand out here. Uh, all right, getting official information. I talked about this a little bit earlier. I, who signed up for OBX alerts? Oops, oh, this great. Now, if you're getting ones you don't want, because you, we, we got a lot of opportunities there, if you live in Manio and you don't want the duck 
alerts, you got to go back into your profile and deselect those. But if you're getting ones you want, that's good. Uh, we have one that's Dare County Emergency Alerts. That's the one where we'll send out large pieces of information about evacuations using OBX alerts. Um, there's a short video. I, I'm not going to play that either, uh, but it will describe how to do it. It's on our website, how to sign up. And I have to talk about the integrated public alert and warning system. On your phone, there's government alerts if you have a mobile phone. If you don't have the government alerts turned on, you're not going to get the tornado warning that Eric sends. It's not going to come across on your phone. You're not going to get the evacuation order that we send using iPaws. So you have to have the emergency government alerts turned on your phone. I know how to do it on an Apple phone. I don't know how to do it on an Android, but it's, it's simple to do. And, and you'll know they're on because when a, a tornado warning goes out, a severe thunderstorm warning, a lot of different warnings that they send out, your phone's going to go, oh, and it's going to say weather warning, or it's going to say public safety alert, and it's going to come up. And the only ones you can't turn off are the presidential alerts. You, you can't turn those off. But, so make sure your, yours are on. And it, we'll, we can help you tonight if you want to make sure they're on before you go. But make sure those things are turned on. And for the folks out on the video, that video is also on our website, and you can take a look at it in the virtual world as well. Oh, hit the wrong button. I, I got to talk about ocean hazards. Any, any place I get an opportunity to talk about ocean hazards, we have them out here in Dare County. We lose too many people in the ocean, whether it's through a rip current or just a longshore current or shore break. We do have a system where we can push information to people. You can, if you got visitors coming in, they send a text, OBX beach conditions is 77295. You can sign up for it on your profile as well. You'll get a couple of email or text messages every day about the beach conditions. And uh, we got to push the weather service forecast into the hands of people before they go over to Dune so they can make the right decision about what they're going to do at the beach today. So I talked about that twice today now, right? Eric, Eric and I were on a webinar with the National NOAA today talking about the exact same thing on a broader audience. But um, I show this slide to we got a lot of people. What does above ground mean and how deep will it get? In our state, the state has the North Carolina. Flood Inundation Mapping and Alert Network, FIMIN, it's called FIMINNC.gov, that flood gauges all around the state. We got about seven or eight of them out here in Dare County. We're getting ready to install some more. And what they do is they tell you when the water's coming up and when it's going down. So on this uh, example, the top picture is during Dorian at the Fesden Center. And that's when the wind was pushing the water out of the sound. You can see it drop and that's what the the canal looked like. You can see how quickly it rose. Uh, and you know, our good friends on, on Ocracoke really took it hard from that. We took it hard in Deer County as well. But you can see how quickly it rose. And if you could start to see it coming up and you still have internet connectivity, connectivity at your house and you're seeing it come up in your backyard, you might want to start heading upstairs. You might want to start heading higher ground in the home because it might get deep and wet in your house. So Feynman's a great tool, and we're, we're getting uh, more gauges installed in Dare County over this next couple of months here. But um, we, we started installing these poles around the county. This one's down at our Rodanti Beach access. You may see there's one, one or two of them up in Southern Shores. All the towns have two of them. We're starting to get them down on Hatteras Island. It's a simple display of how deep it will get. If you, if you know somebody who lived on Bay Drive when the winds blew during Michael, and they had their cars parked in their front of their house and it got to three feet, four feet above ground and their car was full of water. We got to ask the question, how deep is four feet above ground? That tells you. Four feet above ground is about halfway up the yellow portion of that bowl. And it tells you that's how deep it's going to get. So if you're worried about it getting into your house or into your car, that's, that's a simple way of telling you what it's going to do. And we got a little display there that shares that information as well and, and gives information about the products that the Hurricane Center puts out on flood inundation uh, storm surge map. Um, these two videos, uh, I'm gonna play these. Uh, the one from Tom first, irregardless of the sound, if you can hear it out in the virtual world, you'll, you can still see what took place with Tom. This is uh, down on the Florida coast during Mike, Michael, I believe, when Michael came ashore down there. And it just should hit that one from Tom first. It's a short video.
for folks that if you heard it out in the virtual world, that's great. If you didn't, the guy Tom, you could hear the inflection in his voice when he's talking about he saw death in his store, not knowing how high the water was going to get. So Tom obviously stayed uh, where he was. Now the next one is by Debbie, and let's uh, play that one real quick, Eric. Debbie was in a pretty brand new home down there in Florida. She evacuated. I think the storm surge values in that part of uh, Florida were nine to 13 feet. We haven't seen that here, and I hope we never see that here. But guess who did see it in this part of North Carolina not too long ago? I believe the city of Newburn, Eric, saw nine to 13 feet of storm surge. To Florence. Florence. And the only reason we didn't see it was Florence decided to go to Newburn rather than continuing to Dare County. It was forecast to be that high here. So I, I'm hoping we would never see it, but it is a possibility. So um, I spent the last uh, year and a half in this room with Sheila Davies, our health director, not all the time, but she was here running our, our, our response. And I, whenever I uh, get an opportunity, I, I got to encourage everybody to get the shot. Uh, in Dare County, uh, this is as of the 20th of June, we got 58% uh, of our population done. We need to get higher. So if you have friends or hesitancy, please reconsider it. 61% uh, uh, have got the first shot. We want to keep that going forward. And I leave that with um, three main themes, storm surge, run from the water, hide from the wind, know before you go to the beach, and know how to get information up there. So with that, I'm going to give Eric this clicker, and I'm not going to click anything. And Eric's going <laughs> to give you some really great information about the, what the Weather Service does. And in that video, we did see about uh, our decision making. You saw Scott Kennedy. He was a, in a blue shirt. He was a one of Eric's peers down at the is it peer or one of his great forecasters down at Newport Moorhead City. He was here in the EOC with his role of Dorian. He came up instead of us doing it virtually. We had a deployed forecaster here, and that really helps us uh, with it. So we have great support. And now that Eric's got his presentation up, I know he's going to. Um, knock you out of the park with his <laughs> weather talk. All right, Drew. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us in person and at home. Uh, Drew shared a lot of good videos. And again, if you're just coming in, you're just seeing the webinar, you finished up dinner, audio didn't work, whatever the case, you have the PDF um, in the handout section of the webinar. Um, and we'll also follow up an email for tomorrow as well for those that did not see the video. So I am Eric Hayden. I'm the morning coordination meteorologist for the local office down in Moorhead City. Fancy term for the liaison between the weather service and the local community. So all things outreach from education to public safety, anything weather related. Um, I do that out of the local office down in Moorhead City. So we do cover Eastern North Carolina. So the area shaded in yellow or highlighted in yellow is our forecast area. So roughly the Eastern quarter of North Carolina. So it certainly includes the Outer Banks. We go as far inland as Williamston and Greenville and down through the Crystal Coast. Um, other parts of the state are covered by other offices. So we didn't forget Central North Carolina, that's the Raleigh office. The Wakefield or the um, Richmond office covers Northeast uh, North Carolina. So that's Currituck County northward. And then Wilmington covers the Southeast part of the state. We are there 24 seven. This whole last year and a half, some of us were at home, some of us were at work, but we were always open 24 seven. You say, yes, the hurricane last year, we ramp up staff. So uh, on an overnight shift, on a weekend during COVID, that we might have limited staffing, but we ramp up when the weather happens. That dictates what we do uh, down at that office. And that goes true for all weather service offices. Our mission is the protection of life and property. Very, very passionate men and women in the weather service that work long hours because we care about our community. So remember that when you're thinking about forecasts and you know, trusting people, we're doing the best we can and we're certainly putting in the effort. Uh, we're just uh, down at that local office. This is from Florence, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is most of our staff uh, during that, that event. Like I said, we, we cover 24 seven. When there's just regular weather going on, our normal schedule are uh, three shifts, a day shift, uh, which is like seven to four, 
an evening shift, which is two to 11. That used to be my favorite shift before I had kids because I could sleep in till mid morning. I don't know what sleeping in and, uh, is anymore. Um, and then the overnight shift is my least favorite shift um, because it's you get in at 10 or 11 and you get off at seven or eight in the morning. So much like first responders, police and fire, weather doesn't happen nine to two, you get every holiday off uh, despite us working for the federal government. Um, the weather happens whenever it's going to happen. So we're staffed for those emergencies. Our website is crucial for you to remember. Uh, Drew had it. Uh, he showed that sign um, for the storm surge, how, you know, what, what the relation of the height is. If you just remember weather.gov, you don't need HTTP, www, weather.gov. And then you click on your area of interest. So for us, it's Eastern North Carolina. This is the local map. Um, you can get as in depth as you want. My recommendation is to enter your city or zip code in the upper left or to click on the map. It's hard to click on the map on the Outer Banks because we don't have a lot of land area. So enter your city or zip code, Banio, Kill Devil Hills, Hatters Island, get, get your forecast in the general ballpark, and then you can zoom in on the Google map and get even more specific. Uh, and then bookmark that. That will be your seven day forecast. Again, the men and women down at the Newport office, every three hours, we're updating that information. I often get questions. What about the European model? What about the GFS model? We're looking at all of it. We want the right model. We don't care which one it is. And a lot of times that's called a consensus forecast where we average things out. So again, website, really, really good information uh, from hazards to local information. Social media can be a good thing, especially spreading information when it's accurate. So we rely on people to follow us on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and now Instagram. We use social media to wave our hands and say, this is what you need to pay attention to. Our website is good. There's a lot of information on it. Our social media channel will wave our hands and say, this is what you need to pay attention to. So the example from Florence, uh, the upper left, I did that tweet. I was at the office along with a lot of staff. I was getting the calls saying, hey, it's only a category one now. Can we not worry about it? Can people come back home? No, 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 no. We're gonna talk about the category in a second. We wanted people to you know, be reminded that impacts have not changed. Do not let your guard down. Uh, catastrophic flooding. Category of the storm is only related to wind. You're gonna hear that again and again and again. So that's where we use uh, social media. We send Drew and James and the crew at Dare County and Caratuck all over you know, for the Wakefield office briefings. We record the part that we present on YouTube. We're in a quick society now. If you have 30 seconds, then that's not for you. If you have five to 10 minutes and you wanna know everything that we think is gonna happen with this storm, that's on YouTube. And I know they've rebroadcast it as well locally. So best way to find it, NWS Moorhead City. Uh, and a lot of those, including Twitter and Facebook, you can still access even if you're not uh, logged on, you can still see that information. So it's not something that you don't have to jump onto social media just to be a part of it. So weather.gov, and NWS, Moorhead City, pretty much anywhere on social media, you'll be able to find us. So the time to prepare is now for hurricane season. Hurricane season officially starts June 1st. Here in Eastern North Carolina, we've had storms as early as May and as late as October into November. The last couple storms we've had, Arthur last year was May. So again, usually early in the season, they're not gonna be that strong because the water hasn't warmed up, but it still can happen. This graphic is awesome. It shows when the peak is about the middle part of September. The uh, orange or darker red color are hurricanes and tropical storms, and the yellow are just hurricanes. You can see it ramps up um, into August, especially in the middle part of September, and then it comes down. And that's because hurricanes and tropical systems rely on warm water, and that's when the peak ocean temperatures occur. Uh, so the big point of this slide is we can get storms as early as May, um, but you know, traditionally our peak of the season is, is in, uh, in September. I will never, ever, ever forget these, this statement. I'm a kid that grew up in Maryland. I love the snow. I went to school in upstate New York, but I've been here the last four years. So I've experienced a lot. And I'll never forget the year Florence happened. I know it wasn't as big of an impact up here, but somebody said, wow, it's late August. It looks like we're gonna get through this year unscathed. No, don't say that because again, Late August, we're not even to the peak yet. So a lot of you are nodding your head, you know this information. We have a lot of new folks moving to our area. Share that with them. 
it's second nature to you, but it's not to somebody that has moved down from the north and thinks, hey, we got through August, we should be fine, right? Just to back it up, Hermine, Irene, Matthew, again, Matthew and Sandy getting late in the season. Uh, so we have a long season, May through November. Now is the time to prepare. The reason why we say that is storms can uh, occur already, what they have done. Uh, Drew um, mentioned some websites at the local level. For our office, if you go to our webpage uh, and you type in hurricane prep, just add that to it. This is modeled after the, the hurricane awareness week. So a lot of things to consider, um, you know, your hurricane kit, what, what to prepare for, food, water, and medicine at least a week. It may be hard for you financially to get all this in one shot. It may be a lot to grasp. So this is why this weekend you grab a couple can items and next weekend you grab a case of water because what's going to be out when the storm first hits? Water, right? And it's hard to wrap your head around getting it all at once. And again, financially, it might be hard. So get a little bit each week and then you're set. And then if you're like me with young kids or just family, then December and January, you eat some of that hurricane kit, especially if it's some goodies and then you replenish it next year. But again, slow steps, do it now. You don't wanna wait until the storm's here because a lot of places are gonna be out of those, um, those goods and items. So weather.gov Moorhead City for the forecast, uh, the prep page, but also weather briefings. Uh, if you scroll down the page a little bit, at the very bottom, there's a whole bunch of icons, um, the rivers and lakes, current weather, but there's one called hazard weather, or weather hazard briefing. These are not usually updated if there's quiet weather. So we should have taken the one down from Claudette because everything's over with that. Big severe weather outbreak, winter storm, nor'easter. There'll be a small PDF with slides on what we expect with the upcoming weather. So if it's a sunny weekend, you're not gonna see this updated, um, but that is information for you. I mentioned that our, our mission is protection of life and property. We want you to have this information. We want you to share it. And it, you have paid for it. We fall under the Department of Commerce, NOAA Weather Service. We're funded by the taxpayers. So we want you uh, to have this information to get that word out. So. Big thing of that, weather.gov slash Moorhead City. Next couple slides, we're gonna talk about um, hurricane forecasting. Why should you listen to us? So, you know, meteorologists, it's the only job you can have and get it wrong all the time, right? I've heard that joke. I was in TV before, so I heard that all the time. Uh, must, be paid, um, be, must be nice to get paid to be right. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but remember the Hall of Famers only get it right about a third of the time for hitting. So just, just remember that. But back to the forecast. How many have seen uh, that graphic on the left, the one with all the lines? Maybe not the spaghetti, but uh, the hurricane um, uh, tracking, you know, spaghetti models. That is a plot of all the different tracks that could happen with this particular storm. I don't, I don't know if this was Florence or not. They have utility in the lower right hand of that graphic where it's all clustered together. That means high confidence. They're all saying the same thing. Anybody could say where it was going at that point. Then farther down the line toward the coast, it could be anywhere from Florida to doesn't even hit the United States. Low confidence, because the spread is wide. It has utility, it makes sense. But when people are sharing it on social media and you live in Florida, which one are you looking at? That, that one that hits Florida. And when you're on the Outer Banks, which one are you looking at? The one that's hitting by us. <laughs> if you have a beach vacation for the next week, which one are you rooting for? The one out to sea. So those don't have a lot of utility in terms of you know, what is actually going to be happening. We look at all of that at the local level, but especially the Hurricane Center. Over 175 years of experience, the one you should be paying attention to is the one on the right, the one that they're showing on the local news, the one that we put on social media, the one that is from the Hurricane Center. Does it mean it's, the, it's right all the time? No. Is it the best forecast? A thousand percent yes. So please remember that, uh, and you can do your part. When you see something on social media, don't share. 10 days from now, we're gonna get a storm. That, that, that doesn't help stick to the official uh, information. So, well, of course you're gonna say that, Eric. You drove up from Moorhead City, would you say that something else is better? No. So we're gonna show some statistics. How far have we come since 1999 and Floyd versus Dorian? So this graphic shows our average three-day error for a, um, per, a tropical system. So 1999, you know, 
I was a second year in college, but if I was working with Drew, I would tell Drew in 1999, the storm could hit somewhere from Southeast Virginia through the Carolinas down to Eastern Georgia. That would be the average error back in 1999 for the center of the storm itself. In 2019, the year Dorian hit, our error was down to roughly the Wilmington area or Southeast North Carolina. So the track forecasting has improved immensely. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some other examples of that coming up. These are new updated graphics. Again, the most popular question I get next to, do you have a weather app, is something about the European model or the Canadian model, or a lot of people are very weather savvy, which is good, it's very, very good. But we want everybody to know that we look at all of it, and that's where a human element comes in and it makes an improvement. So this is the craziest graphic I'll show you. On the bottom is how consistent the forecast is. You can be accurate 12 hours out, but if you're wish washing, it's gonna hit the Outer Banks, it's gonna miss us, it's gonna hit us, it's gonna miss us. That doesn't help Drew at all. A consistent forecast is just as important as an accurate one. So on the bottom is consistency. Toward the left is more um, um, uh, low error and consistent, to the right is inconsistent. On the far left is track error. You wanna be consistent, but you also don't wanna be consistently wrong. So you wanna be right <laughs> as well. So the lower left of the graphic is the best you wanna be. The least, um, the most consistent, more consistent and less error. NHC stands for the National Hurricane Center. And then as you go to the upper right, that's more um, uh, inconsistent and more error. Uh, you can see the different models, the European, UK, MET, and GFS. They have utility, they can help, but the human element is very important uh, because again, a model is, is binary. It's gonna do this or this or this or this. And then we say, hey, okay, we see that trend. Let's inch it a little bit this way. Let's continue that trend. Let's not do the windshield wiper effect and go back and forth. One thing I do want you to remember, um, a couple of things I'm highlighting in this new presentation from the Hurricane Center. We've gotten better with the track force forecasting. That, that's great. But we're getting so precise now, we don't want people to, um, to let their guard down because while the science is improving, just a 10 mile jog this way or that way means all the difference in the world. We've heard it going back to Irene. Well, I never got those values you, you said it was gonna happen. That's good for you, but this person did get it. So just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it can't happen down the road. There, no two storms are alike. And little wiggles matter. This is another very good graphic if I explain it well. This is with Hurricane Laura last year the dark magenta line, just focus on that one. That is the actual track of Laura. The line to the left, the dotted one with blue is if it had changed 20 miles farther west. I love sports. They're always saying it's a game of inches, whether it's a game of miles. 20 miles is nothing. With our cur curvature on the Outer Banks, that's a huge difference where it's gonna hit. So you can grasp that 20 miles makes a big difference. So based on the track, if it changed 20 miles to the left or to the right, you can see some of those areas uh, in the pink and to the red, which is just in between, between the two tracks, but it would be to the right of the projection, uh, five to 10 feet higher and that red, just to the right of the dotted line. Again, if it had changed by 20 miles, 10 to, feet, 10 to 15 feet higher than storm surge. So a huge, huge deal. So little wiggles can happen. We take that into account when we're briefing Drew. Um, you know, when we show, we're gonna show the storm surge graphic, that's a reasonable worst case scenario. It's a 10% chance. We hope most of you don't see that. But when you come back safe from where you evacuated from and nothing happened, that's a, that's a good thing. But we're preparing for the worst case, that it changes, it wobbles. It can still be an accurate forecast, but if it changes by five miles, we do not want you to be caught off guard. A couple products, and then we're gonna wrap up with impacts, all the impacts that can occur with a tropical system. You might say, well, I came all the way to this class. I know what all the impacts are. You might be surprised by some of the ones that can occur and which ones actually kill more people uh, than others. So another website to remember, uh, weather.gov slash Moorhead City or just hurricanes.gov. We got an S on there. Hopefully that doesn't mean we're gonna see multiple hurricanes this year, but that goes to the Hurricane Center website. Or if you just wanna save our, our website, if you scroll to the bottom, 
and click on tropical or add the word tropical, uh, that will, our local page has all the Hurricane Center products too. So however you want to do it, um, we've got all their stuff as well. We're, we're, we're all together. The tropical weather outlook, um, just a show of hands, I'm kind of curious and you can comment uh, at home, how many have seen this before? Not the track map, so, so good. So, so some people have it and some people have. This is issued four times a day, uh, 2, 2 a.m. and p.m. and um, 8 and 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And this is what's going to happen over the next five days, areas of interest, before it might have a name, before it's on the, the uh, national news, hey, you know, low, medium, high chance of something developing. So with Claudette, you know, before it was a name, I think it got up to 80 or 90 percent chance of something in the Gulf. So that's very, very good. A show of hands have ever, uh, if you've ever seen this map, Yes, so unless you're up in Canada or somewhere that doesn't get hurricanes, you've probably seen this. This is our forecast cone. I mentioned that um, the track has become very, very accurate, so it has actually shrunk over the years. It's not based on the current storm. Um, it's based on statistical analysis, so it's really narrow the next day or two because we should know in the next day or two where something's going to hit, and by day five, it expands. When it does a little circle at the end like that, that means it could go anywhere. It's, 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 there's not a lot of steering currents and it's kind of stationary. This is Florence. A couple important things to point out. Number one, this only shows where the most probable path for the center of the storm will go. It doesn't say who's gonna be impacted and who will not be impacted. For example, in the lower right, during this time frame, that is the wind field, the tropical storm wind field in orange, and the darker shade is hurricane force winds. Notice that goes beyond the path. So again, it just shows you where we think the center of the storm will go. I was talking to Drew this morning. I know Claudette wasn't a, a big deal for uh, pretty much everybody, which is good. It was spinning up by Columbia when we were talking this morning. And I was talking to my kids about how it was a great example of the center was past us. We were done. And we are still quite windy down in Moorhead City. Impacts occur well away from the center. So it's a, not a, hey, I'm in it. I should be concerned. I'm out of it. I don't have to worry about it. If you're anywhere in the general vicinity of this, uh, you should be paying attention. A couple other graphics to go through. Uh, earliest time of arrival. Uh, we use these in the briefings a lot for uh, you know emergency managers. But it, it's good to know uh, this map shows when the earliest uh, that the tropical storm force winds could arrive. Uh, so this is a reasonable worst case scenario. So on this graphic, we would say, if you've got your evacu well, evacuation plans complete, you've got things tidied up in the yard, by Wednesday evening, you should be good to go. That's a reasonable worst case. Hey, when, I ha when do I have to get everything done by? For me, working long days, that's working, 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 and then going home and, and protecting my roses or messing with the garden and getting everything set. Uh, so this is a drop dead, I've got to I've got to be out or I've got to complete my plans by this time. And then the most likely is when we think it's actually going to happen. Um, and that is when we think the onset of the tropical storm force winds will occur. Uh, this is from, I think, Arthur last year. I just wanted to show a, um, a more, you know, a newer one. And we would say something like on this one for the Outer Banks, sometime Monday morning, the most likely time for those tropical storm force winds. Mm -hmm. Those graphics are on our website, the Hurricane Center site. So they're out there. And if you see them, just kind of want to make you aware of what they are. Eric, uh, yes. this is tropical storm force wind arrival time is a key, key time for us. We endeavor to have our evacuations complete before the arrival of tropical storm force winds. Because we want people to be on their way to someplace safe before those 39 mile per hour winds are here especially if they're coming off of Adder's Island trying to get across the bridge or trying to get across the sound. We, those are key. Now, I don't think it's just in Derrick County. I think most, most emergency managers endeavor to be evacuation complete before the arrival of tropical storm force winds. So the good old Stafford Simpson scale. So we, we use this all the time. We talk a lot about this. A show of hands, if you thought this or heard this, I'm not going to leave unless it's a three. I'm, I'm not going to leave unless it's a two, right? I've been through ones and twos before, but threes, I'm out of here. Four, I'm definitely out of here. The category scale is only related to wind. It's to be respected. We had a category four storm. I'm not saying, oh, just ignore it. We got to talk about the other impacts. It is not your sole basis for your decisions. 
It is only about the wind. Uh, so please remember that. It doesn't tell us that the storm is going to sit over us for three or four days. It doesn't tell us that it's a large storm. It doesn't tell us that it's hitting to our left, so we're on the right side of the storm. It says nothing about that. It only talks about the wind, so please, please remember that. Instead of focusing on the category, focus on the impacts. 2010 to 2019, we had a lot of just category ones, right? Just, just a category one, I shouldn't worry about it. 175 people died directly because of that and over $100 billion in damage. Did, do you remember Irene? That just the one. Uh, up here, Hermes, just a tropical storm. Matthew, just the one. Do you remember those names? Dorian, especially Hatteras Island and Ocracoke. Uh, Florence, especially down our way, not you as much. So focus on the impacts, not the category. If you remember Drew's site he mentioned, weather.gov, and this, we're, we're happy. That's a steak dinner for me. We're, we're good to go. Very, very good. So because of that, let's talk about the impacts. We ordered this on purpose, rainfall, flooding, storm surge, and rip currents. For here, I should have probably switched around to rip currents, number one. We'll talk about that in a second. Wind toward the bottom and tornadoes. So why, why did I order it like that? What, why do you think I might have put wind so far at the bottom? What, of all those, what do you think kills the most people in a tropical cyclone? Flooding. The water. Water. So you, you all can teach this class. It's the water is what kills. Like to back it up with statistics. This is an older um, graphic. It's uh, 63 to 2012, about 90% of deaths during that time frame were water. A lot was storm surge. We've made really good improvements with that, but about a third rain, about a half storm surge. If you squint, even with my uh, eyesight, less than 10% wind. Well, Eric, you know, we're 2021. What, what about recently? Recently, still backs up those statistics. On the left, 2016 to 2018, 83% water related. Uh, most was inland flooding. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements with storm surge. Only 4% were storm surge related. We'll talk about some reasons for that. Where you can help us with the water, listening to the local officials on evacuation orders, especially with your vulnerability to surge and water and not crossing flooded roads. More than half occur in vehicles. So don't go around the barricades, don't try to cross a road that you think you can make it through, the road could be washed out, it could be deeper than you think. 2020, last year, 47 direct fatalities. Uh, if you add up the surf, rip, freshwater flooding, seven of them were for uh, uh, Western North Carolina, a couple marine and storm surge, 31 of the 47 were water related. So it's water, 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 uh, not, not the wind. Florence was not a big deal here uh, as it could have been. Uh, Drew did an excellent video in Dare County of just, just a small shift. Again, it would have been your storm. Instead, it was ours down there. And I wanna show you that it's the messaging and we need your help. It's the messaging we need to improve not the science as much. We're, we're, our, we are a science-based organization, so we will continue to improve the science. But look at the forecast on the left. The pink shading uh, and the darker purple, uh, I know for some folks, uh, the graphic I just noticed, the legend's a little blurry, that's 20 to 30 inches of rain. That was the forecast. On the right is what happened. The squiggly little line is the track. I think the air was like five miles at, at five days out. The track forecast was good but the, the, the rain forecast was excellent. So, hey, 20 to 30 inches of rain, great messaging, but was it great? We had 17 people die and 16 were in vehicles. So our big campaign with that is please turn around, don't drown, don't cross flooded uh, roads. Let's see uh, if I can get this. You don't need the audio as much on this. Drew mentioned, and it was actually uh, up to 13 feet, like he said, uh, in Newburn. This is Oprah Cove. So he, he showed you the rapid rate of rise on the gauge. It's just hard to just contemplate like how fast that water can rise where it gets pushed on the Pamlico Sound one way and it comes back. Four to seven feet in Ocracoke from Dorian, um, flooding on Hatteras Island as well. Storm surge, the biggest issue with that is it comes up very, very fast. Those two videos he showed are extremely powerful 
uh, not only is water powerful, but hearing um, the, I think it's the man and also the lady talk about their, you know, uh, decision to evacuate and then one gentleman that stayed, uh, how it's just, it can be very devastating. So many years ago, we tested this and this is now, uh, it's been many years since this has been operational. On the left is a storm surge watch, on the right is a warning. That's for um, surge three feet or greater above normally dry ground. What is that? Drew mentioned the, the poles that can help. It's low lying areas near the sound, near bodies of water that are usually dry and that's two, three, four feet you know, above um, that is what it means. It's hard to explain, but that's what it is. Uh, surge, and those are ones that will come up on your map. Uh, this is from Florence down our way from New Bern. The Neuse River funnels up toward New Bern. Um, this is the potential worst case scenario. This is what um, emergency managers look at when they, you know, as part of their decision making. You can look at this online as well. You can't zoom into your street, but you'll get a general idea uh, for what can be expected. Uh, and this is a reasonable worst case scenario, the 10% chance. Um, not everywhere will see that, um, <clears throat> but that's, that's a possibility um, for that to happen. Last year, it was a test. It's another, another test again. Um, this has been useful, especially social media-wise and some of our briefings, kind of just a bigger picture. Uh, this, I think, is from Isaias. Um, and this is just the storm surge graphic on like a, a wider scale uh, for dissemination so that we can tell people what to expect. So you might see that as well. So, talked about storm surge. Next, I want to talk about rip currents. Um, we had 19 direct fatalities um, in Lorenzo for water related, and we had eight deaths up and down the East Coast due to Lorenzo because of rip currents for North Carolina alone. The storm in Lorenzo, it never hit here. It certainly didn't. It was 2,000 miles away. Nice weekend. I think it was October. Uh, water still warm long period swell, it doesn't look ominous. You know, it's not a, a thunderstorm type of day, hey, I'm not gonna go to the beach. Should just making people aware the dangers of rip currents uh, from distant tropical cyclones or ahead of tropical uh, systems themselves. We put that messaging into those briefings. Uh, so in a lot of the briefings, we've added this. And again, you might say, who's swimming during a hurricane or a tropical system? Other than the surfers trying to catch the big waves, it's the family that has one more day of vacation and the storm's not gonna hit here until Sunday and it's not raining and they've, they've traveled down from Ohio and they're gonna get one more day in. And it, again, it doesn't look ominous. It's a long period swell that has a lot of energy and we want that message to get out. That is another possibility uh, from tropical cyclones. Just general beach safety, Drew mentioned this before so I won't hit on it too much. Uh, the biggest thing with us is trying to swim at a lifeguarded beach. I've got younger kids. That's why we're paying down at Emerald Isle to swim right in front of the lifeguard. We're not far away at an isolated part of the beach where there's not a lot of people. Uh, pay attention to the signs and flags. If you swim at a lifeguarded beach, talk to them. They will tell you where to swim, what's going on, uh, things of that nature. Uh, don't become a victim by trying to help someone else. Call 911, get help from a lifeguard, throw them a flotation device, and um, you know, call for help, don't, don't go out there. I know it's very, very hard not to try to help someone, uh, for sure. And everyone really should have adult supervision. I'm a safety person, I gotta practice what I preach. So I was telling my kids, you know, we're in the water, I'm there with them. I said, that, that even goes for dad. I shouldn't just, I can swim, but I should have somebody else in the water for me. Not just rip currents, but what if I have a medical emergency? Think in pairs in, in terms of the water. Uh, for people to help call uh, the lifeguard or 911 for help. The messaging we've tried to improve as much as we can. Uh, these, um, we have new graphics where it looks crazy with all those beaches, but you, you know the area, but people only know that I go to Kill Devil Hills. They don't know what who Buxton is or Frisco or, or what have you, unless that's the beach they go to. You know, you live here, you know them. So we try to put on there as much as possible. Um, and then we've worked with inland offices. I think this is an example from, this is last year. So just a, it was a high risk day and I think there was good weather coming up. So something that we shared with inland offices to, uh, to uh, share with others. All right, did you want to say anything on the rip current one? Are you good? Okay. So storm surge, talked about rainfall flooding, rip currents. Toward the bottom is wind. On the graphic Drew showed, um, Run from the water, because again, that's a that's a 
that's the top killer, hide from the wind. Uh, so yes, you can have disruption of power communications, uh, block uh, evacuation routes. This is my neighborhood uh, during Florence uh, and some of the wind gusts that we had. But I want to kind of compare and contrast it to hit the, the category uh, scale again. Uh, show of hands if you remember Arthur. Some of us. So we were certainly impacted. So this is a category two storm, uh, similar landfall by Cape Lookout, Beaufort, so to our south and west. So we were on the right side of the storm, uh, certainly had hurricane force winds for all of the outer banks, and we did have storm surge on Hatterson, and I think in Manio as well. Uh, so impactful, a smaller storm, uh, fast moving, but it was a category two, right? How many of you remember Irene? So a little, little more, more impactful, but it was just a one. However, it was a similar landfall. It's no trick. Oh, Eric, it hit somewhere else. No, not the same spot. Very, very large storm, slower moving storm. So we had more impacts uh, in our whole area, including Dare County from a category one storm. Just to reemphasize, don't just focus on the impacts um, you know, or what the category scale is. And thinking back to Dorian last year, it also depends on where it goes and, and the track on what's going to happen with the sound. How's the water going to come back this way? And it, it's very track dependent and intensity dependent. And that doesn't show up in the cat one, two, or three. So thinking about the impacts with Dorian, when we said four to seven feet, a lot of people were still surprised that it came up that fast and it happened. Uh, so please focus on the impacts and don't just say, hey, it's just a one. And don't say it's never happened before, because unfortunately, that's that's the new records. You know, things think not every storm is the same. Uh, tracks, intensity, location, um, all varies and the impact will vary as well. The tornado threat on here, I've got a more recent one for Dorian, but you certainly had this with Hermine. Um, any tropical system can produce tornadoes, not just hurricanes. We saw that here with Tropical Storm Hermine. The reason why I want to mention this is they can often occur well away from the center itself, and that means the early rain bands. So although a Florence might miss you, the center, Hurricane is not just a dot. Just because it hit down by Wrightsville Beach doesn't mean everybody else is safe. You, If you're impacted by those outer fringe bands, either early in the storm or maybe you're on the periphery of the storm, you can be at risk for tornadoes. Uh, this produced the EF2 down there, um, and it can it produce enhanced areas of damage. I wanted to hammer this home. The reason why I'm showing Florence is because I think this is a, a really good graphic that captures that. The red arrow is Wrightsville Beach. That's what, where it made landfall. We had tornadoes up toward us, but more the western part of the Pamlico Sound. And then a couple of days later, you still have the circulation spinning up in the Richmond, Virginia. Well, well, well away from not only where the landfall occurred, uh, but for time-wise too, many, many days later. So as I wrap this up, we've made a lot of improvements on the track forecast. Please remember we mentioned the wobbles, the small changes that can make a huge difference. Please focus on the impacts, not just the category. And start to think about some of the indirect fatalities. And what we've noticed the last couple of years, we're starting to get more deaths on the back end of storms. So we've done really well with the messaging on the front end, uh, but with Hurricane Laura last year, seven deaths in the United States, which is pretty low for a uh, magnitude uh, of that strength. 34 though were indirect deaths, and that would be like uh, carbon monoxide. So 16 because of carbon monoxide. Uh, so historically, storm surge was the leading cause of fatalities, but in the last four years, we've lost more because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So you've got your generator, know how to use it, not to use it inside. And it seems like simple, simple things, but uh, that is a silent killer. So please, please think about your health and well-being after landfall. Um, safety, going up on ladders, um, just, you know, it's not over until it's over. And it's, you're three weeks beyond it and, and we can focus on nice weather, hopefully around the corner. Uh, this is just a graphic. To, this is, goes back to the 63 2012 graphic. Um, it is uh, eight times as many victims over the age of 60 as under uh, 21 years old. Uh, so it tends to be folks that are above 60 uh, for that. So that is it. We're just over the hour mark, which is pretty good with all the information you got. So what we're going to do now, that is my email. If you have any questions, um, you know, you, you want a presentation like this. We're, we're getting back to doing more of these. So we do school visits. We've been to Nags Head Elementary School. 
we'll, should be up here, knock on wood, for the Seafood Festival. Uh, so we're in the community a lot. This is our community, not just because we're down in Moorhead City. So if you ever need anything, that's the email. For those that are at home and you've been patiently watching and in person, now it's your turn to ask questions. If you have any hard questions, you send those to Drew and James and I'll take the easy ones. But on the webinar, I'll, I'll open it up. I'll uh, see what questions we have, field some questions. And for those at home, if you wanna ask a verbal question, you wanna raise your hand, I'll call on you and you just unmute your mic. So you're well, ready? Thanks, Eric. Yeah, we're ready. All right. Hopefully the uh, folks at the virtual side are still with us. You know, it's a little hard to, we've gotten really used to doing virtual meetings in these days, but sometimes they're not as perfect as they could be. All right, so let's see if we've got anything. We've got 34 people still with us on the virtual side, so that's better than. <laughs> All right. So again, if you've got any questions at home, you can just type them into the questions box. I see a couple ones about audio from before, but if there's any questions, questions, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so you don't see. But the sound went off there. That's early. Sometimes people. Um, well, any questions here? Anything we can shed some light on this map? I have a question on the reentry permits. So if somebody just moved here, like myself, get the DMV. Contact. Get the DMV. Do a change of address. Do a permanent address. As quickly as you can. Make it priority. So much easier to get through a checkpoint with a driver's license with a Dare County address on it. Okay. And if you already got a North Carolina driver's license, you came from Charlotte. You can go on. You can go and change it online and get a change of address online to a Premier County address. That's the challenge with appointments. So I'd recommend trying the online options first. First, you can do it. Change of address if you already have a North Carolina license. Yeah. And they'll, they'll print something out. And you'll get the hard one in the mail, but you'll have it as a paper to show if you need it. So you can change your address on. To change of address on North Carolina licenses. So we've got one here. Uh, again, if you're watching from home, I see a couple hands raised, so I'm going to call on you here in a second. Um, the one toward the bottom, Susan asked, uh, and again, for those at home, they can just see us now. We stop sharing the screen, so they won't uh, see the questions or who asked them. So a suggestion on where to go if you have multiple animals or maybe just animals in general. Yeah, well, I, I hope you can find some family and friends to go with or a hotel that would take the animals as well. The, the worst case scenario is if you open up inland animal shelters, uh, most of the time there's a, a shelter that is for our, our good human friends. And then down the road, there's an, a, a pet shelter. You know, the, there is a, if you have large animals, horses and things like that, the state does open up a, a large animal shelter at the Martin Center. I think it's the Martin Center out in Martin County, I believe. Mary John, mm -hmm. looking at you because you Bob, 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 Bob Martin Bob. Agriculture mm -hmm. Center out in mm -hmm. Martin County. Yeah. They do open up a large animal shelter out there. And they also take pets and other things. But uh, please try to have a plan to, now as to where you're going to go with the, with your pets or animals. And But in the worst case, there are shelters that do open up around the state for animals. And if I could add to that, I would say just making sure as we're entering hurricane season that not only with that preparedness kit, you're thinking of yourself, you're also thinking about those animals in terms of food, leashes, making sure they're up to date on their vaccinations. If, they're, if their vaccinations have lapsed, they might not be entered into a shelter or even a, a, you know, a private uh, vet who does boarding kind of thing. Having a good supply of medications on hand, having a crate, uh, you know, unless you've got a great dame, maybe uh, you can find a crate that'll fit your animal because it may be a shelter will accept them as long as they're crated. So build those things into your preparedness plan so you make sure that your animal's safe. We don't want anyone not to evacuate because they're worried about their pet. I, I, I love my dog, but at the same time, I, I, my, I value my life and I wanna make sure my dog is safe and I'm safe as well. We're gonna try an audio question from the audience. So Chuck, I see you've got your hand raised. So I unmuted you. And then Chuck, uh, if you just go ahead and unmute on your end, you'll be able to ask a question. If you did it on, um, by accident, just lower your hand. So I'll give you about five seconds to unmute, because sometimes people hit it by, um, so it'll be Chuck the court. Uh, if you wanted to ask a question, you just unmute on your end. I 
So Chuck, you might have hit it by accident. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you. Uh, so we've got one from um, let's see. Uh, so Deborah Hoyt, you had a question. Deborah, I see you're unmuted, so you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can loud and clear. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. Um, we recently moved to Buxton, and we have public water. But I was wondering if the power goes out, you know, if, whether it's an hour, or a day, or an extended period of time, does the city water still flow within your house, or is there some type of pump that the water, the city water system uses, and that pump would go out? I'm just curious about like running water in the house and showers, toilets, things like that. Deborah, welcome to Dare County, and congratulations on your move to Buxton. This is a Drew Pierce, and our water department does its best to keep the water flowing as best they can. All of our water delivery systems are on generator. Uh, as long as we have power, we can make generator power and we can pump water. But please do not make your decisions based on me saying you may have water. You, you need to make sure you have enough consumer, uh, portable water in the house to take care of you and your pets if you have them. And you, and you could be without water if we break a line of, you were in Avon two weekends ago. You were without water for a good period of time because we had a line break. And we do see line breaks during storms. We do have a great water department that gets out and fixes them. But it is uh, it is uh, Hatteras Island and the lines are in the sand and uh, it's, it's the infrastructure is sound, but it doesn't take much to damage it. All right, Thank Deborah. You. Appreciate that. Do you mind if I piggyback on that just with a public yeah. safety? Um, so, uh, Barbara, during Hurricane Matthew, I've got a friend who lives in Brigham's Bay right around the corner from you in Frisco. Are you familiar with that subdivision? Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, my, my point being is that they had water, but they had such significant flooding that when a neighbor's house caught on fire, the fire department was completely unable to get to that property, and that house burned down to the stilts. And luckily, the occupants weren't there. Uh, my good friend was there at his house. So he's watching a house burn uncontrollably a few doors down from his, and he's sitting there worried about you know flaming embers coming on. So when we think about our infrastructure, even if we have water, even if we have firefighters in our fire stations, that doesn't mean that uh, different impacts from the storm can impact you know whatever may happen should it be an emergency, whether it's a fire, someone has a medical emergency, all those things. So I just want to follow up on that one. Thanks. Thanks so much, Deborah. We'll meet you. And if you have another one, um, raise your hand again and then just lower it for now so I know that you're good to go. So, Bob Cropper, I see that you uh, have your hand raised. So, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And then, if you would like to ask a question, you just have to unmute on your end. You just click the little uh, microphone button. Oh. So, Bob, I see you lowered your hand. So, maybe it's just by accident. That's okay. Um, let's see. And then, Chuck, I'll give you one more chance, Chuck. Uh, Decor, you've got your hand raised. Uh, if you wanted to ask a question, just unmute. Anybody else that wants to ask a verbal question? We're kind of wrapping up here. I don't see. Uh, is there another one, Drew? That's a yeah, yeah. question mark in the question here. Okay. Uh, the question pane is to the left. I don't see. I think that means that they put something here. Yeah, they put something. So on the left are the questions. Okay. We're caught up on the questions. Rand Bailey, I don't see. Oh, I didn't scroll down. Good eyes. Oh, no. So, Brianne, we saw that you asked a question, but I don't oh, see right it here. Okay. Right oh, 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 just on. Oh, okay. yeah. So, I don't see any in the in the questions pane. Do we have any questions in person while we just make sure everybody's good at home? So, I think we're going to wrap it up. I'll do one more time. I don't, I don't think Chuck just did it by accident. So, I think we're good, Drew. I don't see any more in the questions box and no more hands raised. Are we? Yes, yeah. It's just open to the public because I, I'm not running for nor from anything. And I enjoyed your presentation this evening. I'm a 37 year veteran of Harris Island. And I can only speak to those men and women who have served in office and other related capacities for the local fire people, and fire chiefs, and so forth. And I know through a number of hurricanes, your prognosis and Drew's and his predecessors and others was just fine. But the day to day, in and out, hammer, 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 went right through the police chiefs talking daily. You needed something at five o'clock at night, you let it be known because it was in there in the morning somehow. 
that got there. And I would encourage people who are new to the area to locate, become friendly with, and then suddenly find out that most of the firehouses and their geographic locations also were homes to the EMT and everyone else that you could find. And Drew, to you specifically and to Sheila, uh, while this is not necessarily weather related, related, both of you did, you and Sheila and your colleagues, one of the finest jobs of inoculating people, the people in this county have been all over the country here now in the past two or three weeks in various commentaries and environments. And they keep saying, well, what do you know about this Derrick County, North Carolina? And I'm very pleased to say, I'm from there. I'm proud of all the people that are there, and I know them, and they're sincere, dedicated people. And to my my friend Sheila, my heart goes out for her, and my wife and I are going to keep her in our thoughts and prayers and her neighbors for a long time to come. Well, well thanks for that comment. I, I would just say, uh, you know, our fire chiefs down on Hatteras Island and our local responders down there, they're the belly button when we, we have a disaster on Hatteras Island. They rise to the occasion each and every day, whether it's in their community or in Ocracoke, they come together. And our job up here from this building is to support them. You know, we, we have a warehouse across the street. Our job is to get them what they need, whether it's down in Hatteras Village and getting into the auxiliary so that they can get it out into the community or in Frisco with our CERT team coming together to, to, to rise to the occasion down there. Our job is to support those those people and those those organizations, the Hatteras Methodist Men, the Hatteras Island CERT, all of those people on that amazing island that uh, rise to the occasion to help their neighbors, we're here to support those. So thanks for those comments. And they're they're not, they're always in our thoughts and always on our front lines of uh, how do I get across the bridge to get that stuff? Or how do I get the ferry to run? How do I get the supplies to them? And, and I'll make sure Sheila gets your comments as well. And also not to find any more work or nights away from your family or anything else, but another avenue that you might wish to look into to getting the information of the weather, weather service and to do what you do and so forth are one of my favorite groups called the animal groups. Well, who the hell are the animal groups? Elks, moose, lion, eagles, rotary, da 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 da, -da keep on going. Yeah, and the anglers. Men and women. <laughs> <laughs> and they're the one of your groups. And you know what? They're all looking for programs to entertain their members. And you can quote me on that. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we know that. We, we get to them. Yeah. But now we're now that we can get back out and start have meetings again. It's well, great to do it for criticism. No, no, yeah, yeah. It's not. But we they're on our they're on our calendar, on our on our radar. So um, other great questions from uh, from y'all and Georgia. Great Thank you. Thank you. I would, would say this is your emergency operations center for the folks that are on the uh, virtual piece. We still have a few left from us. If you ever want to come out and visit, uh, my information is available on the website. We'd love to show it to you. Uh, here at the Dare County Emergency Operations Center, we also have the Dare County Regional Emergency Communication Center right next door. Those are the angels and the men and women over there that answer that 911 call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they take an emergency. Probably one going on right now over there. They take so many calls, and they are the calm and the peace that somebody gets when they're in a disaster that doesn't need this part open, but they get disasters going on probably right now. And they're getting the help to those people. So they're they're right there. They're it's a state of the art facility, amazing facility dispatch, not just for Dare, but Hyde and Terrell County as well. I, I offer, if anybody wants to stay, we'll give you a quick tour of the rest of the building. More than happy to do that. And for folks that are with us virtually, if you want to come on out, just uh, let us know. Our information's on the website. James loves to give stores. We all do. <laughs> Thanks for coming out and joining us for Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.